start looking at what are the key challenges. Mm -hmm. We've um, exhaustively discussed the logistics issue as the major challenge uh, during the election, which INEC has also taken cognizance of, and uh, they are very open to ensuring that they improve on their performance, which we actually observe in, during the governorship and the State House of Assembly elections. Uh, I think for them to have uh, uh, taken note of challenges, uh, experience uh, encountered during the presidential election and improved on that, uh, we, can, we need to give them kudos for that. But as much as we give them kudos, we also need to draw their attention to well, other challenges which are also related to logistics because why we consider logistics to be very fundamental is because it's, 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 it's very significant to shaping people's thinking about the election itself. It gives certain uh, impression about the INEC preparedness for the elections. Um, uh, it's more or less like a precursor to other things that people react to. Like, for example, people started noticing the perception of uneven distribution of social materials to one place or the other. And that is very, 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 very dangerous for the election because it determines how people respond to issues on the election day. So um, while INEC is making effort to do that, we also need to look critically at the intervention of other stakeholders who play a significant role on the day of election. And security agents is one of the major uh, uh, they are uh, they, they are ineptitude in responding to, you know, in, in performing their function on election day is, uh, is a source of serious concern. Um, the main idea of deploying uh, our security is to ensure security of votes. And by saying security of votes is to ensure that there is no issue of incident of vote buying is not tolerated in the polling unit. The, they are able to put in place measures to ensure that political thoughts um, uh, you know, do not disrupt the process of voting and accreditation at the polling unit. Uh, to ensure that political talks uh, do, not, uh, do not disrupt the process at different coalition centers. But it's kind of unfortunate that uh, we see more of them like Aiden and Abetin, uh, not responding at all in most cases to are uh, living up to their expectations or uh, to their mandate. So um, they sometimes just look um, you know, away from vote buying and you know it, it further gives this impression of you know impunity. On the part of party agents, they just come and buy, buy their vote without taking cognizance of the fact that uh, that is unlawful act and there are security agents on ground to curtail their essences. They just do that because they believe that uh, security agents won't even also respond. The other issue is the militarization of the entire process. Ordinarily, police are supposed to lead. The experience in rivers shows the kind of uh, leadership puzzle between the military and the police. So they should be uh, understanding and uh, the role that each of the security agencies needs to play on the election day should be well uh, spelled out. And those who here in delay they are, they, you know, delivering this mandate should actually be held accountable. We, we, we have judicial institutions that are meant to hold some of these, ensure justice. is an injustice against the citizens, injustice against the people who came out endlessly to vote on the day of elections. But so if these people uh, actions in way or the other uh, questions the credibility of the process, is questioning uh, the, 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 the effort people put in place to come out and vote on election day. So they should be held accountable and we must, a certain set of people must be held responsible for what has happened. So there, there are a lot of issues, even on part of the citizens, uh, like vote buying. People cannot buy your vote if you are not willing to sell. So uh, I think there are a whole lot of issues that we have to deal with in elections. Before, just before we let you go, what is, what is the solution as an observer to people, you know, to reduce the rate at which people get disenfranchised just because where they registered um, the is phone. different from where they, you know, maybe they, they moved houses or something and at the end of the day they, they, they can't vote. What do you think is the uh, way forward? I, I would say um, just um, limiting the concept of disfranchisement or attributing it solely 
to the issue of people not having access to PVC or not being able to vote in any location they have on the election day is not is doing injustice to the entire conversation of disenfranchisement. The reason being that military political talks for making violence on election day is a way to create fear. And when there is fear people will be scared to go out to vote. It's also a source of you know factors that we need to take cognizance on in discussing disenfranchisement. So um, on the part of INEC, INEC still needs to look into that, but the fact is the electoral act is very clear. You cannot vote where you did not register. You have to vote where you registered. So it is something that we need to take up to the National Assembly to see the possibility of you know, getting that session amended. But the other part of it in terms of um, logistics around distribution of PVT, PVC, we need to engage INEC seriously to ensure that they, uh, uh, within a particular timeline, they are able to deliver uh, on the PVC. But on the part of fomenting violence on election day, people engaging in vote buying, in a way I see that more as a source of disenfranchisement. Because when you are constrained to take or you are compelled as a result of circumstances around you to take certain electoral choice at the polling unit, it is more or less disenfranchisement to you. You can vote, but the fact is that your vote is a dictate of certain circumstances. So I, I would say for that, it is a long term, we need to develop a long term strategy that would be able to facilitate a social re-engineering and reorientation of citizens at large. Uh, people who, who foment violence on election day needs to uh, uh, realize the fact that that is not the best way to deal, uh, to act on election day. People who say that vote needs to realize that that is not the best decision to take on election day and so on and so forth. Okay, sir, please, one more question before we leave. Looking at inconclusiveness of uh, our political system. What is your way? What is your advice on your INEC in terms of declaring election inconclusive? About uh, the law is very clear on you know declaring. It's just to look at the politics, and you know as we all know, the inconclusiveness of the elections is as a result of certain happenings on election day. And we can't deal with that without dealing with those happenings. We need to ensure that those things did not happen on election day. But if it happens, INEC has no choice, you know, follow the letter of the law to declare it inconclusive. And, uh, you know, one of the key uh, decisions of INEC is that where certain things happen, the area will be recorded as zero votes. Only where certain circumstances beyond, uh, which is totally different, which is not, yeah, it could be a human factor, but it's something that could still be considered as a factor that could that shouldn't lead to zero, you know, recording of zero vote in that area. Those are the areas that they consider as cancelled vote. And I think um, before we can address this, we need to address other issues which I've earlier mentioned, uh, which are very, very significant wow. to determine the outcome of the elections. Thank you. What a Excellent delivery. <laughs> Thank you, sir. So, what's your name? My name is Saeed Adelanwa. Okay. Um, who do you represent here? Well, I'm the founder of Change for Africa Foundation, wow. a Pan African civil society accredited by INEC. Wow, excellent. Wow. To observe election, to do voter education, as well as youth sensitization. Okay, my first question will be this. What do you think INEC can do in reducing the rate at which people get disenfranchised? In, 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 the, uh, in the interim, I really would not want to go... Sorry, please. I really would not want to... Why are you telling me? Okay. So, I, I really would want to go into why uh, INEC disenfranchised anybody. But for us, we believe that a lot of Nigerians don't know the reason why they vote which informs why a lot of people are disenfranchised because they lack understanding. And for us in Change for Africa, we believe strongly that understanding is the secret of outstanding success. So if people know the reason why they vote, they ought to have known that you can actually relocate where you vote. Even on website, in, on, uh, even through um, um, what's it called, through INEC website, you can actually reconfigure where you your polling booth sh should be by visiting INEC website and entering the necessary information to transfer 
your uh, voting um, your no your your no your voting details as well as your 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 voting area exactly basically yeah something like that so how has it been uh, going on on the journey of being a voter educator yeah basically we've we started voter education since 2014 in Nigeria uh, change for Africa was in about um, 22 states across the federation where we gave out for example freebies like um, 5 kg bag of rice, granite oil, we gave out um, souvenirs and the like just to tell people to vote wisely and vote their mind. As against when people give you these things, we vote for them. We did it and we have a documentary evidence to show that we did close to about six trailer loads of rice, granite oil and the like. So just to send signal to people is a case study which we did to send signal to people that there should be no amount of money or freebies or whatever it is eh, enough to, to make you sell your vote. Where, do you, where, where were the things that you critiqued uh, INEC about here today? Or what was your recommendation to them here today? I, what I not criticized. I said critiqued, sir. So it's positive, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I know. I know. I I mentioned the the function and effectiveness of the card reader. Like I said earlier, understanding is still the secret of outstanding success. Too many of our observers, too many of our electorates, too many of even some of our POs does not even understand the function of the card readers. The card readers is first of all meant to read your card and then authenticate and then vote, allow you to vote. But in most cases, too many people don't know that the card reader is expected to first read your card and then authenticate. They just feel the moment he reads your card and is not authenticating you, you cannot vote. But once he's read your card, I think that should be an opportunity for you to fill an incident form and then you can vote. So our complaint here is that the, 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 the card reader works based on our own um, broad experience. We're talking about general overview of our capacity as a civil society organization that observe election in all, most all the state of the federation is that in the ratio of about 95% of card readers read um, electorate cards. But sadly, it couldn't um, authenticate in about, uh, I think, 30 to... Kunle Fagbemi, Executive Director, Center for Peace Building and Socioeconomic Resources Development, CEPSAD. Okay. I'm Tony Ajolore of On Duty TV. And I'm Incense from Press Television. So generally we would like to know to have a perception towards this 2019 election. Now, in terms of the 2019 general elections, it must be clear that we have a lot of issues that we must interrogate. Mindful of the fact that the date for the election was actually first mentioned by the Commission February 2017. And unfortunately, built up to that is the fact that the Commission held nothing less than nine Commission meetings before the end of that year, 2017. And unfortunately, the entire year 2018, they had series of meetings until they eventually sometime in Q3 ended up presenting what appeared to be the appropriation request for an election that they set the date as far back of 2017, which for my organization and for someone like me brings a lot of concern in the sense that you cannot have said you're going to hold an election come February 2019 as far back as February 2017 and you are having issues. The issue of the electoral acts being made properly well packaged and scaling through all the orders of legislative processes and assent. The second aspect of that issue is the fact that the Electoral Commission did not push forward the appropriation request until late in the day in 2018, which means that whereas 
the media, unfortunately, became complicit in not properly interrogating the issue by asking the right questions made it unfortunate that we had a situation where the buck of blame was placed at the doorstep of the National Assembly. The, National, the Eighth National Assembly indirectly became the whipping boy. Eventually, we ended up having a rescheduled election from the date that was originally set and determined two years before then. For me, this is one area that we must interrogate. The second aspect of this is the fact that not only do we now have a situation where the appropriation did not come upstream early enough, and the way it was done is such a manner that leaves us again to take a second look at the legal framework that says the electoral management body derives its appropriation as a first line charge because the executive branch made the mistake and did complicate matters by saying they were buying funds from already allocated resources which in itself is an illegal act of the executive branch of government to do because when you say that the electoral management body is expected to draw from first line. It means that there must be no encumbrance associated with the funds from which the electoral management body, INEC, is expected to draw. This is quite unfortunate and it is very insultive on those of us who understand that in statecraft, legal and policy procedures and frameworks must be followed. In this particular wise, now that the election is over, I want to encourage those of you from the media to do the due diligence of taking a look at this. When you move further and you now look at the arrangements for logistics that are supposed to provide the required support because it was the logistics that was the albatross for the rescheduling of election from February 16 to February 23rd. It therefore means that there's a need for us to reinterrogate the logistics dynamics and service delivery associated with election cycles. I'm hoping that the lessons learned will be that we will move forward. The next thing when you're discussing the 2019 general election is a security arrangement. Whereas the Electoral Act, the legal and policy framework says that the electoral management body and under the direction of the chairman of the commission will be solely responsible for the deployment and direction of all security operatives during electoral cycles. Unfortunately, this did not occur because of the nature and character of the command control system being operated by the Nigerian National Security and Defense Management Architecture. And there is a need for us to begin to take a second look on how to truly, technically do the operational things required in terms of service delivery for the performance of security during election cycles. Um, you want to assess in terms of the conduct of political parties. You will discover that unfortunately we had the new manifestation of electoral violence. Quite a number occurred preceding the electoral cycle but associated with the campaigns and electioneering. A number of it has not been fully interrogated and exposed by the media and the civil society actors. One of it is the economic violence that was meted out on Nigerians which you can look at from the angle of the popularization of the Nigerian community. The Nigerians became rather poor and then you can now start talking about it in terms of vote buying. 
you cannot start talking about it in terms of the fact that nobody could really utilize the resources they have in their banks. EFCC was on the loose, harassing people. A number of agencies and organizations involved in financial system in the country became unnecessarily scared. And when you look at the indicators and tie it to the, uh, the National Securities and Exchange Commission data, you begin to understand this. Again, when you take a look at the CBN statistics, these are clear things that will show you that we experienced a lot of economic violence during the 2019 electoral cycle, more than we've experienced between 2003, 2007, 2011, 15. And I'm hoping that these are some of the other aspects of the electoral system that we'll be looking at. Well, let, before I let you go, to, uh, a follow-up question on the security uh, aspect. Do you think um, cameras should be mounted at maybe polling units? Because the masses, that's what they are calling for. Now, if you're saying they should prosecute those that come, you know, uh, did the killings, carried out the violence, how would they be traced when we don't even have the data, addresses of people? So, are, we talk, are they talking into the air or what? A man said we have a video so do we need such Please, intervention? No. You see, when you're discussing security system in the country, you need to understand it as a holistic package. Currently, what we are doing with Nigeria Security Sorry. Services Delivery is called silo management which means you just take the electoral security independent from other security. You take human security away from security of establishments and access control and things like that. When you start interrogating and seeing everything as a complete whole, then we will begin to appreciate that ultimately when things are put in place it will become easier that on election day you will discover like in other countries even in neighboring Togo because they have a very good national identification system that is properly integrated you do not see the over security personnel involvement uh, if for the lack of how to really capture that, the involvement of security personnel is not as massive as you have it in the Nigerian states in crossing Republic of Benin, Republic of Togo, because they have a very good national identification system. And they have a social safety net that is working. And you have a dynamic that has been put in place which we too equally have, but we are not interested in activating. When you're talking about policing, because you're talking of policing the electoral system, in the real sense of it, policing as a triad. It's a tripod when you're talking of policing. You have the regular statutory policing, you have the community policing, and you have what is called the hybrid in between the community and the regular statutory policing, which is the vigilante system, the neighborhood watch which is supposed to be interfaced. When you have all that put in place, you'll discover that what you will have is a synergy that cannot easily be faulted. I'll give you a good instance. When you have two policemen whose normal beat is on a particular street, and when it comes to election, they already know everybody on that street. They can tell you relatively that this man lives in house number four. Most times he leaves his house by 7.15 in the morning. His neighbors too understand that he leaves about seven, but the policeman, because he's already trained as a statutory regular policing officer, he knows that I can document that the man in house four leaves 7.15, the one in house six leaves about 7.30. If there is a disconnect on a particular day, because I grew up in Bodija in Ibadan, and we had a similar instance. The day my father was a little bit ill, and he did not go out when he was supposed to go out in the morning, the policeman that used to serve our street 
came knocking on our door to find out what was happening that my father had not gone out that day. Until you get to that level where policing becomes a collective thing and then everybody does their own bit, you will discover that we will keep on doing all this lopsided. We are not going to continue successfully if we are doing silo security management of elections. Election is just an event for a process that will help you to really bring about a change of regime. But if you have every system working, you'll discover that people can walk in and walk out, do their voting and go.